Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the next Generation 4 International Forum webinar presentation. Today's presentation on thermal hydraulics and liquid metal fast reactors was presented by Dr. Antoine Grunschenfeld. <clears throat> Before we get started, there are a couple little housekeeping things um, to kind of go over with you. The first is uh, in regards to asking a question. Everyone should have a control panel that they can see that it has the uh, orange rectangle with a white arrow. Uh, when you click that, it'll open up a dialogue box and in that there's a pane to ask your questions. Um, so go ahead and type questions into that pane and submit them. We will take all the questions at the end. The audio is broadcast over your computer speakers, so uh, if you cannot hear me, please unmute your speakers. Uh, you can select the radio button on the right-hand audio pane display to adjust the volume. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact the GoToWebinars help desk at the number shown on your screen. Again, the questions will be taken at the end of the presentation. You can go ahead and type them in any time during the presentation as they occur to you but we'll take those um, at the end of the presentation as time allows. Today's broadcast is being recorded, so please feel free to watch it again or share it with others. Give us a few days just to upload the recording to the uh, Gen4 website at www.gen-4.org. Um, on the handouts pane, you should have a copy, um, be able to download right to your workstation or your device a copy of the presentation slide deck as a PDF. You also have a handout showing all of the previous GIF webinars and the upcoming webinars uh, through November 2020. Um, so an information brochure for you. Last but not least uh, on the screen is a link to a SurveyMonkey, a brief survey. Um, there's also the QR code for people on mobile devices. It's a little easier perhaps. We do appreciate your feedback and request if you take just a few minutes following today's presentation. Um, it helps us improve the webinars um, and get your input. We do take your input um, very graciously. Doing the introduction today is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the technical group manager of the Radiological Materials Group in the Nuclear Sciences Division at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the chair of the Gen 4 International Forum Education and Training Task Force. So without further delay, I give you Patricia. Thank you so much, Berta. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Antoine. Thank you again for. Um, volunteering to give this webinar. So Dr. Antoine Gershenfeld obtained his PhD from L'Ecole Normale Supérieure in France in 2012, and he has been coordinating R&D on the thermal hydraulics of sodium fast reactor at the CEA thermal hydraulics and fluid mechanics section since 2013. In that capacity, he has led the development of a subchannel thermal hydraulics code, as well as the development of a tool for coupling coarse and fine models in a single reactor scale simulation. He has also been involved in a number of collaboration, bilateral exchanges with projects on liquid metal reactors with the DOE, JAEA, IPPE, and Euratom. And finally, he is very involved in international working groups with the Gen4 International Forum, the Nuclear Energy Agency, and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Thank you again, Antoine, for volunteering to give this webinar. And without any delay, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for this very kind introduction. And good morning, everyone, and thanks for connecting to this webinar on sodium fast reactor from hydraulics. And so uh, I'll start immediately. So, so as, as many of you probably know, uh, as around one third of our, of our six generation four designs in the generation four, in the generation four forums actually use liquid metal as a coolant. 
So one of the two is the sodium fast reactor, and this is actually uh, a design that has been uh, tested and put at, and put into practice as, at the, as in at the industrial scale a number of times. So there's uh, there have been uh, 20 SFRs in as much as eight countries, and currently we have two in commercial use in Russia. And the second Gen4 design that uses liquid metal is the lead fast reactor, so the LFR. And this one has active project in Russia as well, in Belgium, and in collaboration between Italy and Romania. And of course, the reason that we have uh, two designs using liquid metals is that they have a number of advantages over, uh, for instance, water. The first one is that uh, they have good neutronic properties for fast reactors, so little neutron moderation, small absorption. The other thing is that they have a very large temperature working range at ambient pressure. So usually, they, for instance, sodium become, becomes liquid at around 100 Celsius and remains liquid until around 900. So we've got 800 degrees of temperature range. And with lead, it's even better. And uh, the next thing is that they have very good thermal conductivity. So they are very useful as a heat transport fluid. But at the same time, they come with their own challenges. And uh, one of the regions where, where, they, where they have specific challenges is in thermal hydraulics. So the behavior of uh, heat, and, heat and momentum transfers in the fluid. So first, what is, from, what is thermal hydraulics exactly? So, oh wait, so it's almost working. Let's see, yeah. Trying to advance the slides. So this is okay. Yeah. Can you advance me, Berta? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thermal hydraulics, that's the behavior of the fluid in the reactor, more or less. So what, we, what it deals with is what's the velocity in the fluid, what is, what's the temperature, and, and what is the pressure. And here, in our case, we are mainly going to be concerned with the liquid metal in our, in our, LM, in our liquid metal fast reactor. So maybe, maybe we will have either sodium, lead, or let me start a eutectic. But also in this, uh, in the package, we also need to cover the cover gas in the reactor, for instance, uh, argon at the top of the primary circuit, or maybe the power conversion cycle, which could use steam or nitrogen or, or another thing. And it covers also two very different types of calculations. One is for the normal operating state of the reactor. So it's going to be a steady state in normal operation and the goal in that case is going to assess the loads imposed by the fluid on the structural materials of the reactor. And the main issue with that will be that we will need to justify that these materials can last the expected lifetime of the reactor. So for instance, uh, 60 years for the structures. And also we've got the, we need to deal with accidental scenarios. And in that case, the goal will be a much shorter term, but it will be to assess a transient and uh, we, we want to know if the reactor will be safe in, uh, for instance, in the event of an unprotected loss of flow. And if we see that uh, maybe we've got a problem or two, maybe we need to adapt the design of the reactor as well. So what I'll be dealing with in this presentation is first a little uh, overview of uh, the main thermal hydraulics issues that we encounter in liquid metal fast reactors. And then I'll talk about the types of tools that we have at our disposal to analyze these issues. So the more, mainly simulation tools and experiments. And then I'll give you an example of an, an example application of this to a practical case. And it's going to be something uh, very fashionable since the Fukushima accident, which is the study of natural convection, passive decay heat removal in a reactor. <clears throat> Oh, I got the, I got the problem again. Oops. Um, yeah, thank you. So the, so the main features of the, of these liquid metal reactors, as I said, is that first, they've got high working temperatures. 
So in sodium fast reactors, we usually have a cold temperature of around 400 Celsius, and we go all the way to 550 for the average hot temperature, and the local maximum temperature will be a bit higher even. And in lead fast reactors, they end up being around the same. And the main reason for this is that the main thing that limits temperature in a liquid metal reactor is related to the materials. Since it's uh, somewhat hard to justify that uh, common steels can resist long term temperature, long term, uh, for instance, four years or maybe 60 years for the, for the structures at above 700 degrees we usually limit ourselves to something like uh, 650 degrees. And then we've got, uh, no, and then in order to reach these temperatures, we do not need any pressurization. And so we can rely on these pool type designs. So we put all the primary circuit in one big pool. And uh, this allows us to minimize the consequences of a pipe break. And this is very useful for a sodium reactor where, where breaks and leaks could have chemical consequences but it's, it's useful in general to minimize the consequences on core cooling. It also gives us a very large thermal buffer in case of an accident, because we, we're going to have thousands of cubic meters of liquid metal that we can heat up progressively to absorb the decay heat. And then at, at the top, of course, there will usually be a cover gas to allow for thermal expansion of the, of the, of the liquid. And then, so we, the, the fluid in this primary circuit will move the heat from the core in the middle to the heat exchanger you can, you can see on the right. And in sodium fast reactors, usually we have uh, these exchangers go to intermediate loops that are also in sodium. And this is to prevent a possible uh, sodium water reaction in the exchanger. And then in lead fast reactor, you could have a direct exchange to steam, for instance. So moving to the next slide. Oops. Thank you. So this is the, the overall scheme of a common sodium fast reactor, sodium fast reactor and lead fast reactors look about the same. So you have the core in the middle with a number of subassemblies all in parallel. The liquid metal goes in forced convection from bottom to top, and then it exits at the top in this purple hot pool you can see at the which is delimited by this uh, inner vessel in purple it goes it hit it goes straight into what we call an upper core structure uh, a structure that is above the core and that includes some instrumentation and maybe the drive lines of the, of the control rods for instance and the the hot food goes hits this UCS, goes to the to the outside radially and enters this and enters these intermediate exchangers, right? intermediate exchangers right there. From there, it gives away its heat, ends up in this uh, cold pool here at the cold temperature of the reactor, so 400 degrees from sodium. And then it ends up going around and moving in, and moving all the way into these primary pumps here that are going to pick it up and pressurize it a bit in order to compensate for the pressure drop in the core. So usually, the whole pool is at uh, hydrostatic ambient pressure. And right after the pump, you may, you may have something like three or four bars of added pressure to push the liquid into the core. And then you end up in this uh, diagrid pressurized structure under the core. And there are some holes at the bottom to allow this, the liquid to go back into the core. And we do a complete turn like this. And then there is a little auxiliary system you can see at the bottom, which is something you need to prevent this uh, main primary vessel on the outside here from heating up at the top. So at the top, you have hot fluid in the hot pool here, and it, uh, it, it, it's beneficial to have this main vessel here at the coldest temperature possible. And so what is usually done is that you pick up a little flow that would otherwise go into the core, and you inject it in an, in an annular space all the way around the pool. So this is going to cool it down at the cold temperature. So 400 in sodiums and maybe a little, a little less for lead. It's going to go around and come back into the cold pool. So this is the vertical view. And then on the side view, you can see that everything is usually distributed radially. You've got the core in the middle, liquid coming into the heat exchangers on the hot pool side, coming down, 
and then coming from the heat exchangers to the pumps on the cold side. So uh, next next slide, please. Oops. Thank you. And so let so from this overall view, let's begin our little uh, let's see journey for, through each element in the reactor. So the first thing we encounter starting from the core is the inside of the core subassemblies. And actually, the subassemblies in a in a liquid metal reactor are usually quite complicated. So you've got very tightly packed fuel pins yes, like this and this is because we want to minimize moderation or absorption by the coolant and so since they are packed so tightly usually we use these wire spacers right here so this is common in almost all sodium fast reactors and in around 50 percent of lead fast reactors and using these wires means that there will be some non-trivial coolant mixing effects and this, they are going to be very important when we want to compute the nominal state of the reactor. So usually, material specialists uh, from, uh, from uh, irradiated material studies will give us a goal on the maximum temperature of the fuel cladding. And they will tell us that if we manage to stay below a given temperature, like 600, 650 degrees, then there will be no cladding rupture over the lifetime of the fuel. And so we need to do the thermal hydraulics computation to guarantee this point. And then during an accident, the goal will be much shorter term. And we need to check that the cladding will remain below its melting point, And we will not have a transition to a severe accident scenario, for instance, where the, where the core would be disrupted. And we need to know this at a local scale. And at least we need to have it for each of the pin in each subassembly in the core. So as I said, in the nominal state, the main primary hydraulic issues in this thing are going to be taking into account these mixing effects by the wires or by the grids that could, you could have in a lead fast reactor. And then in, a, in accidental conditions. So in, in sodium fast reactors, there is the possibility that the coolant will boil before the fuel melts because the melting temperature is 1200 degrees and the boiling temperature will be around 900. So you could have sodium boiling before the cladding breaks, breaks down. Of course, then you could have a, a, a cladding melting and possibly rupturing before and releasing fission gases. And a common problem, both in sodium and lead fast reactors is, what could happen if you have a blockage, a blockage inside the fuel assembly? And in this case, flow will be disturbed, cooling will be disturbed as well, and the, temperature, the local temperature will increase. And this requires a thermal hydraulic computation. Uh, so moving to the overall core, so, first looking at each of assembly separately and then to the big overall view. So when you consider the, the core in its entirety, another thing that happens is that with these uh, fast reactor subassemblies, usually the subassemblies have hex cans around them. They are uh, isolated from each other from an hydraulic point of view. And you can, show, you can choose for each subassembly what the flow rate will be in normal operation. And uh, normally you, in the core, you would have a power distribution with more power in the center and less on the outside. And so if you want to have an optimal cooling of the core, it's beneficial to have more flow rate going into the middle than in the outside. And this is something that's done by allocating different flow zones in the core. And this, this is actually a rather complex optimization problems. So how to allocate the overall flow between the subassembly of the subassemblies of the core is a thermal hydraulic optimization problem. And then you've, got all, you've also got to account for the, the mechanical behavior of the core. And this will be mainly, mainly determined by the actual temperatures of the hexagonal cans around each subassembly. And so if you, if you want to know this one, you need to compute the thermal hydraulics in the whole core, deduce the hex can temperature by accounting for conduction, and then do a calculation of the mechanical equilibrium of the core. There's also some interesting problems in accidental scenarios. The first one is that on top of the flow inside each subassembly, because we've got this X can separating subassemblies from each other, you can have cool, you can have coolant coming down between the subassemblies. And this is something called interwrapper flow and can have a very strong effect when you are in a natural convection decay heat removal mode. And in particular, it can completely cool. For instance, if you had uh, subassemblies in internal storage, so used subassemblies that you store 
on the outside of the core at the end of a cycle, and they can be completely cooled down by this mechanism. At this scale, you can also have coupled effects with, for instance, the neutronics of the core. So usually we use, uh, as, as thermal hydraulic specialists, we use uh, very, very simple point kinetics models, but you could also use uh, 3D kinetics, for instance. Also related to this is the thermal mechanics of the fuel, because the neutronics is strongly influenced by Doppler effect, which depends on fuel temperature. Fuel temperature itself depends on the thermomechanical properties of the fuel, and at this level, you can have a coupling with thermal hydraulics. So moving out of the core, we encounter the hot pool. And here you can see an overall view of the hot pool of a liquid metal fast reactor. So you've got, this is the temperature. So you've got flow coming out of the core at very high velocity in normal operation, hitting the support core structure. And here you can see some control rod drive line mechanisms at the top. And you've got a jet of hot liquid coming out almost horizontally hitting the first things it comes in contact with, so in this case, the heat exchanger, and coming into these, these intermediate heat exchangers and then down. And so this is the temperature profile, and now you can see the velocity profile, and you can see, uh, similarly, this very strong jet coming out, and at the top, you've got this uh, nice recirculation, recirculating flow patterns like this. Coming back to the temperatures, you can see here that you have some temperature heterogeneities here. Because, for instance, this is the subassembly position for a, control rod, for a control rod. And so there is no fuel in this, in this position. And so the temperature, there is also much less heating. And so you have a cold jet coming out in parallel to all the hot jets of liquid metal coming out of the subassemblies. And this is actually one of the first thermal hydraulic issues that we encounter coming out of the core. So, the, so talking about this upper core structure, so the first thing is that it's a very complex piece, it's a very complex piece of equipment. You've got usually thermocouples coming down above each subassembly to monitor your outlet temperatures. You've got these control rod drive lines here. Here you can see uh, the, the, the outlet thermocouples for the Phoenix reactor. And you've got this strong temperature difference between control rods and uh, the narrowing fuel subassemblies. So in nominal state, this is actually the source of the first main issue for the thermal hydraulics. If you have cold coming out here and hot liquid coming out right there, in practice, you will have turbulent, thermal, turbulent temperature fluctuations right at this position. And this can be very damaging to the materials of this control rod drive line. So this uh, jet mixing effect has to be taken into account. And then when you study incidents or accidents uh, in the reactor, one of the first things you could have is that if, for instance, you scram the reactor, the power will go down very rapidly and you will have a cold shock on the UCS. If you, if you have an unprotected transient, you will get a hot shock instead. Another issue you could have is that because you have a jet coming out of the core and then sideways, it's not actually obvious that the measuring positions of the thermocouples here will give you the actual outlet temperature of the subassembly below. You will see some mix of the actual subassembly temperature and its neighbors. And uh, this needs to be assessed in order to interpret correctly the, the measurements from these thermocouples. And then coming into the rest of the, of the hot pool, so the hot pool is, of course, uh, a very large uh, volume of liquid metal. So in the Astrid reactor project in, in CEA, for instance, it was more than 1,000 cubic meters. And so for this, well, you've got some issues as well. So the first is, where is this outlet jet actually going? So in normal power operation with strong pump speed, it will usually go horizontally like this. And on the other hand, if you have a uh, slow flow, so for instance, uh, natural convection or something like this. Instead of going radially, it's going to be moved by buoyancy forces, the fact that hot liquid is a bit lighter, and it's going to go up instead like this. And, and this can be an issue for, for reactors that want to do partial power regimes. For instance, 50% power, 50% flow rate, all velocities divided by two, and this jet might not go in the same position as in normal operation. Another issue is the position of this thermal interface right here. 
So this, an, this is an issue for the steel structure, the inner vessel that you get here. It's going to see, for, if it sees thermal fluctuations or, or, uh, or a very strong temperature gradient, it may have mechanical issues. And so this needs to be assessed from the thermal grade point of view and uh, checked for, to, to, to ensure that the design will last for its 60 uh, year lifetime. During, during uh, accidental scenarios, you can also have, well, you, if you have hot shocks coming into here, then they will also be propagated all the way there. So you, you can get hot and, hot and cold shocks on the vessel and on the components in the vessel. And then during a transient, if the flow gets lower and lower, then this jet will have a very different a very, a very different direction and stratification might also occur. And this is something we will see in more detail later. There are also some specific issues at the very top of this pool. So as I said before, in these uh, big pool type reactors, we need to have a cover gas with something like argon at the top in order to absorb the volume changes of the liquid below with temperature, for instance. And if, if we have a free surface like this, well, one, one thing you could get is some uh, wave patterns right here, some uh, oscillation of the free surface. And this, of course, can cause thermal fluctuation on the structures at the outside and uh, maybe thermal damage. So we need to check for waves. Another thing we, we need to check for is the thermal transfer between the liquid metal and uh, the reactor slab at the top because this, this will give you the amount of cooling you need to add to the slab in order to keep it at the temperature you want in normal operation. Another thing that can happen, and this is mainly a problem for sodium fast reactor, is that if the liquid velocity is high in this region, then it's possible that vortices could form, like in a, in a, in a sink in your bathtub, for instance. And this can lead to vortices going down into the, the hot pool and possibly entraining some bubbles of gas into the complete primary circuit. And this is something that can have consequences later. If you have a load following reactor, usually when you change the power, the power of, the of the reactor and the flow rate at the same time, this free surface will change its level. And this, this can lead to thermal stresses on the vessel right here. And finally, in, uh, we've, here we've got uh, in an accidental scenario where you can have uh, consequences in left fast reactor. So if you have, for instance, an, an earthquake, then the earthquake can cause sloshing in this pool. And you, so you, you will again have waves. And if you have a left fast reactor, lead has a very high density, right, around 10. And so it can lead to uh, mechanical constraints on all the structures right here. And this is, this is something that is not too important in sodium fast reactors, but becomes more important if you have lead. So moving into the heat exchangers. So the heat exchangers are actually some very complex, complex pieces of, mach of machinery. Uh, they've got thousands of tubes. Usually they are straight tubes like this. And uh, the first thing that uh, needs to be assessed in normal operation is what is the actual performance of these heat exchangers? So what is the pressure drop on both the primary side going around the tubes and the secondary side going inside the little tubes. So what's the pressure drop? What, what is the actual heat transfers? And also what thermal loads are going to be experienced on the tubes during a normal startup and shutdown. And this actually was the source of many problems on the Phoenix reactor in France because of uh, that differential thermal dilation of the tubes and the rest of the exchanger during uh, normal during uh, move from uh, stop state to normal operation, these exchangers had to be replaced many times. And then in accidental scenarios, you can also have additional things. So one is that at very low flow rate, you can actually have some complicated flow patterns inside the exchanger. So for instance, a recirculation between the inside and the outside. The shape of the jet coming out of the exchanger is also of particular interest. And this, will, this is something we'll see just later in the cold pool. And finally, if you have uh, hot and cold shocks, for instance, if you're scrubbing the reactor or, or doing an unprotected transient, then you could have some uh, tube rupture problems. So going into the cold pool, 
So usually the cold pool will be even larger than the, than the hot pool. And uh, it's going to have some very different temperature profiles in normal operation and in, for instance, uh, low flow natural convection. In normal operation, the, hot, the cold pool is, will usually be very homogeneous and completely at the cold temperature with some profiles at the top where you have the vessel cooling system on the outside and coming back down. And you, have, you will have this outlet jet from the heat exchangers right here. And so in normal operation, what we want to know will be the shape of this jet. For instance, it could you could have some... Uh, so as you can see, this jet will usually not be at a homogeneous temperature. There is a little hotter part at the outside and the colder part at the inside. And this little temperature extension into the cold pool can actually hit some uh, structures right in front of it and potentially cause thermal damage. So we need to know where this uh, heat exchanger water jet is going. And uh, one, of, one thing that can happen is that if the flow gets a lot lower, then this jet will go straight up like this and contribute to stratification in the cold pool and maybe from our loads on some other structures. And so that's actually the, what we need to compute for in case of an accident. So where the jet is going and what thermal stratification will be. And this can be important both during loss of flow transients, so when we lose the pumps. So this is uh, what is actually pictured on this uh, right figure. And another thing of interest is what we call dissymmetric event. For instance, if the reactor is operating and then one of the intermediate loop strip, then cooling will be removed from this exchanger. And suddenly you will have hot liquid coming, up, coming down on one side of the, of the cold pool honey. So you will have a hot shock in the cold pool on one side, and then it's going to propagate in the cold pool. And this can be actually quite interesting to model. So then coming out of the cold pool, you've got the pumps. So in the pumps, the main issue in nominal state, so they're going to pick up liquid from the cold pool and inject it back into the core. And the main issue is going to be their performance in, in normal operation. So, so they, their full uh, characteristic, so this is the so this is the delta P, the pressure difference provided by the pump for a given rotation speed and a given flow rate of liquid metal. And in, in normal operation, we will only be interested in the normal operating point of the, of the pump. But then for accidental scenarios, we will be interested in a lot of other values of this function. So for instance, if we are modeling uh, loss of flow scenarios, then the pumps will be stopped and we will need to know the pressure drop of the pumps when it is stopped. If you've got an event where one of these pipes at the outlet of the pump and before the diagrid breaks down, then the pressure in the diagrid will drop and the other, pump, the other pumps may go into overspeed. And this can lead to cavitation inside the pump. In, uh, in some cases, for instance, if one of the pumps stops but not the other, you may have reverse flow in one of the pumps and some other complicated problems. Another thing that can happen if you have a, if you have a transient like uh, loss of heat, a loss of heat sink, then you may have the pumps operating, but the temperature in the whole, in the whole pool will go up little by little. And at some point, the temperature may be so high that the thermal dilation of this rotating part may make it contact the outside. And then you will have seizure of the pump at high temperatures, and you will go into a loss of flow scenario on top, on top of your loss of heat sink. So this, this is also something that uh, needs to be watched out for. So then coming out of the pumps, we've got the diagrid. And this here is, a, this is actually a picture of the EBR2 diagrid on the, on the reactor on the same name in in <clears throat> in INL. and so the so there are two things that uh, we need we need to model in this diagram is first it's actually a quite complicated structure so you've got lots of tubes going around because they are going into the sub assemblies and so on and so the pressure drop of this component is actually not obvious you can also have some local flow effects for instance at the parts of the diagram that are closest to the inlet pipes for instance here the flow will not be homogeneous. And so typically, this is something that needs to be computed to know if uh, you may not have what you expect in, in the sub-assemblies that are closest to these inlet parts. 
in sodium fast reactor, we also have the, po the potential for gas accumulation in this dia grid to watch out for. And this is something I'll elaborate a bit on later. And then we've got the accidental issues. So the first thing is, in, uh, in all liquid metal reactors, when you have an unprotected accident, the, the thermal dilation of the dia grid is actually the source of one of the strongest neutronic feedbacks in the reactor. If the dia grid heat up, heats up, then all the subassemblies will be drawn apart, the complete core will dilate, and the neutron reaction will, will slow down more and more. So this is something that is, that is actually very important when you want to model an unprotected transient. Another thing of importance is for all these dissymmetric transients. So for instance, trip, trip of a single pump or uh, the breakdown of a pipe like this, then you will have usually uneven flow at the core inlet. If this pipe breaks down and the only pump contributing is this one, then the subassemblies of this on this side will have more flow rate compared to the average. And this is something that uh, can be important to model. Same thing for these uh, intermediate loop transients. So if you have one of the heat exchangers losing its uh, heat removal power, then hot liquid will come out into one of the pipes before the other, and one part of the core will receive hotter liquid before the other. And this, this is also something that you may need to model. And so finally, the only thing we we still need to look at is this uh, little vessel cooling system here. So this is sodium that you pick up from below the core and you inject on the outside of the main vessel to cool it down. It's not so little actually, usually it's uh, 10 to 20% of the flow rate provided by the pumps. And so for this one, well, what, what we need to model is the actual thermal transfer from this hot liquid to this liquid in the cold pool, which may be a bit colder to the liquid from the vessel cooling system. And so we need, we need to model it in order to know if our vessel cooling system has the, right, uh, has the right size. And then if you use a system here where you, have, where you have liquid metal falling down like a fountain from the vessel cooling into the cold pool, then you may need, you may have bubble entrainment at the bottom of this wheel type design. And so this is a, there is a potential for gas accumulation right there. A final thing that can happen is that in an accidental scenario where you have what we call a reactor vessel cooling system, so you've got a cold source here, then you could have cooling of this vessel cooling system and you can have liquid metal going this way, cooling down and going straight below the core and contributing to the cooling of the core itself. So this, is, this can actually uh, be a very good source of cooling in a liquid metal fast reactor, it's the flow reversal in this kind of cooling system. And then before we move on to the modeling, I'll, I'll show, I'll talk about two issues that involve the complete primary circuit. So the first one is uh, this uh, gas entrainment problem in sodium fast reactors. So what can, I, what can happen with this gas? You can have vortices forming at the top of the hot pool here and and training bubble into the primary and then the flow of sodium will touch these bubbles and move them down into the rest of the circuit you can also have if you have a weir a kind of weir at the top of the vessel cooling system you can have gas coming down from here and also here you could have dissolved dissolved gas nucleating in the coolest part of the reactor so here you here you, you will have hot liquid metal and so a higher solubility threshold for gas. And here, because the temperature is lower, this, uh, this dissolved gas may nucleate and give you additional bubbles. And then all this can be moved around and potentially accumulate at the bottom of the, of the diagrid right here. So because usually the inlets of the subassembly will be in the middle, there is some kind of dead zone at the top and you can have a pocket of gas accumulating in this. Uh, somewhat dead top part of the diagram. And then the, the, the worrisome consequence would be that if you change the speed of the pumps, for instance, you could have this pocket that could uh, that had accumulated in the past, moving all the moving all at once into the core, transferring into the core and causing a positive reactivity event. 
So we need to assess that no pocket large enough to disrupt the core can accumulate. And in order to do that, we need both to control for all of these sources and then use specific system to ensure that uh, no large pocket can form below the core. Another issue that I, I'll cover in more detail later is the decay heat removal modes in uh, liquid metal pool type reactors. So a big advantage of these liquid metal reactors is that we can have completely passive decay heat removal. Usually what we do is that we insert a specific heat exchanger in the hot pool at the top, and we connect this exchanger to a liquid metal circuit that can operate in natural convection. So we connect we connect the other end to an exchanger in a chimney like this that will actually be cooled down by air. And so air will be our final heat removal source, and this never goes away. And so you will have cooling here, natural convection in this circuit, and cooling will be provided at the top of the pool like this. And then the question becomes, how does heat go from the core right here to this exchanger right, right there? And the answer is that uh, in a cool type reactor, it's quite complicated. You can have the normal flow path like here, like this. So path number one is liquid metal coming down into the cold pool, into the pumps, below the diagrid, and moving up in the core, doing the normal path. But you can also have cool liquid metal coming down at the outside of the hot pool, coming down in the cooler subassemblies in the core, doing a U-turn below and coming back up. So this is a recirculation loop between subassemblies. The final thing you can have is that this same, this same cold liquid metal can actually go down on the outside of the core and then move around between the subassemblies in this interwrapper region like this. And then it can cool subassemblies from the outside, heat up, come back up, and uh, contribute to core cooling. So the, so the first challenge is to model all these flow paths correctly to know what's going to happen at the level of the core itself. Another possible issue is, is in this circuit right here, because usually this circuit will be stopped in normal operation, and then you will have to start it when uh, a loss of heating happens. And so the first issue is that you need to ensure that during startup, the temperature will not go down in this part too fast. And so uh, you will not have freezing in this part, which would completely stop the overall flow. And then another thing you need to ensure is that uh, the natural convection like this will start up on time and uh, will not have trouble. Also, a potential interest is that the intermediate loops connected to these exchangers might contribute to the removal of decay heat, at least at the beginning. All right. So now that we've seen all these uh, interesting from hydraulic problems, one thing we need, we need, what we want to know is how do we describe them? How do we model them? And there is both good news and bad news. The good news is that for from hydraulics, especially in single phase, so if we don't have to deal with uh, liquid metal vapor, then we've got the Navier-Stokes equations. Which can describe or which can describe what is going to happen ab initio from uh, first principles. The only problem is that these equations are not linear, and they induce turbulence. They induce a lot of small fluctuations. So typically, if we want to do an ab initio simulation like this, you will need to go all the way from the small turbulent fluctuation in the reactors, which will be of a scale around one micrometer and around one microsecond all the way to the complete reactor itself, which will be of a, around 10 meters big. And maybe you will have to simulate something like 100,000 seconds, a few days. And this simulating from this scale to this scale may be, may be possible before I retire, but uh, it's not very likely. And so because the, this uh, ab initio modeling is very heavy on the, compu on the computational side, and uh, not, not practical uh, in a real situation, we need to do something more. And what we do is that we introduce uh, what we call a cutoff scale. So we, we fix ourselves a, a, a given scale, and all phenomena above that scale, we will aim to simulate directly by simulating the equation with uh, computer programs. All the phenomena below that scale, so everything that is smaller, then we will not be able to simulate directly, 
And so we need to introduce what we call physical models or correlation to describe these phenomena and introduce them into what we, we can actually simulate. So when we, when we go into uh, actual practical application, what Tramal algorithm specialists did is that they chose different values for this cutoff scale. The smallest, the smallest scale on the right is where you have a very small or no cutoff. And this is, if, if your cutoff is so small that you can describe the exact geometry of the reactor, so for instance, the little wires between all of, the, of these pins in the subassembly, then you will be doing what we call computational fluid dynamics of CFD. And in this case, the simulation scale will be very small. You will have a few physical models, not too much, but the computational cost will be very high. On the other hand, here, this is what happens when you choose a very large cutoff scale. So here we have what we call the system scale or STH, system for hydraulics. And this is a scale where, for instance, for the complete hot pool like this, you will have one big average value. In a little uh, one, in a model like this for an exchanger, you will have one average value in a 1D profile. So the, comput the computational cost will be very low, but on the other hand, you will need a, a lot of physical models. Actually, for every phenomenon, you need to model. And then sometimes you get something in between like this. So this is what happens when you, are, when you, when you want, for instance, the local temperatures around each fuel pin. And so you end up with something that uh, is 3D. And this is what we call, in this case, the subchannel scale. You, so you will have one temperature value between each uh, trio of pins. And here you will need model for all the fine geometry that you cannot have. So for instance, at this scale, you cannot see the wires, and you will need physical models for the wires. And here, just for information, I, I've, given, I've given you the names of the codes we use at CEA for liquid metals. So go, going into a bit more detail, we've got, so first going from the finest to the biggest, first we encounter CFD. So as I said, CFD is when you model all the geometry of the reactor or, or of a local part directly. So the, the geometry you, is above your cutoff scale. What is not above your cutoff scale is all these small turbulent fluctuations. And there you have three choices. The first one is you simulate everything. So this is what we call direct numerical simulation of DNS. And it requires some very small computational meshes, one micrometer. You can also, you can choose to, mo to model, so to not directly simulate, the smallest turbulent fluctuations. And this is what we call large eddy simulations. And this can allow you to, to have somewhat bigger meshes. So you gain usually a factor of 10 to 100, and this decreases the computational cost at the cost of a physical model for the small fluctuation. And finally, you've got the option of trying to have all turbulent fluctuations below your cutoff scale. So you need to model everything from turbulence with a physical model. And this is what we call Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. And if you do this, normally you can use the, a mesh size that is only given by geometrical features. So this usually allows for meshes that are from 0.1 to 1 millimeter in size. So this uh, runs lowers numerical cost, but you have to introduce physical models. And this is mainly what we call turbulence models. And they will need to be validated either against a finer simulation that would directly simulate the turbulence or using an experiment. And of course, if you do a simulation where the turbulence is described by your model, then you will lose information on all the turbulent fluctuations, like for instance, in this picture of a Japanese experiment. So this is actually an oscillatory behavior between a hot and cold jet. And if you do a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes simulation, this, uh, these fluctuations will not be available to the simulation. So here are two, two examples of uh, what we typically can do. If you want to do a direct numerical simulation, usually the best we can do is, for instance, a few, like 10 centimeters in height in a single subchannel between three pins and the subassembly. So this is very expensive, and we can only do a small region. And on the other hand, if you, if you use the RANS, the Reynolds Average Navier Stokes, then usually the cost is so much covered that you can get to model a few sub assemblies in their entirety. So you can see the gain between direct simulation and uh, 
the runs. Then moving, moving up in cutoff scale to the subchannel. So these are codes when you, where you have uh, one mesh, one computational mesh per uh, fluid interstice between two pins. So this is something where you, the, what you cannot simulate there might need the effect of these wire wrappers or grids. And so what you need as a, what you need for models are the frictions and the mixing effects caused by these uh, helical, helical wires. So they both, they, they have a tendency to increase friction in the bundle, but they also induce mixing between neighboring channels. And the, and the next thing you need to model is what the actual transfer, heat transfer is between the pins and the fluid. This is something that needs to be calibrated on experiments. Or uh, what's more, the most fashionable thing today is to do a fine simulations and use and use this to calibrate the coarser model. This is what is called high, high to low. And so the, the going to this coarser scale, coarser scale has a very big advantage over CFD in uh, compute in terms of computational cost. So, for instance, if you are only interested in the, in the steady state. You can usually use these codes to get the full steady state of your core in less than one second, very fast. If what you want to compute is a transient state, it will take a, a little more effort, but it's perfectly doable. And then moving all the way up into the system codes. So first, you should know that these are actually the original from hydraulics calculation tools. The first one, we have one is from 1966. They're, they use the coarsest mesh possible. So you've got pipes like, like the heat exchanger rear, you do them in 1D and big volumes, you, you, do the, you do them with one big average value like 0D or maybe sometimes a coarse 3D. You need physical models for everything. So friction, heat transfer and so on. And also what's interesting in this code is that usually they include additional models for stimulating a complete reactor transfer. So for instance, they tend to have a, mod a model for the core neutronics with point kinetics usually, but some codes have, have some 3D kinetics. So you can compute the power, the evolution of the power. They have modules for pumps, for heat exchangers. And another interesting thing with this code is that they can simulate several circuits. So you can have, for instance, the primary circuit, the intermediate circuit, and the power conversion system in the same simulation. And they do all this with a very low numerical cost. It's very rare to have a system scale simulation that takes longer than 15 minutes on your own computer. And so when you look at uh, the type of issues we have, usually what will happen is that if you want to model a safety transient, a transient, an accidental transient where some pump stop or the reactor is crammed and so on, you need to model the complete reactor and so the only the system scale has all you need. They've got all the models and they can describe the complete reactor at a low cost. So that, that will give you, this is what you would typically use for a transient. If you want to do something like a core design, minimizing pin, the maximum pin temperature over the complete core, then a typical tool will be this uh, sub-channel scale because it's going to give you the per pin temperature, temperature maximum for all of the core at a low cost. And sometimes maybe you will, you will want to know some more about local effects. And in this case, you can use CFD of uh, some specific places. And then if you've got some more complicated geometry dependent phenomena, then the typical tool of choice will be CFD. So if you want to model big 3D evolution in the big pools, for instance, rents, so CFD that models turbulence would be uh, the tool of choice. And if you want some, some, to model something that will depend on primary fluctuations that are related to turbulence, then the typical tool would be LES scale CFD. And then you've got some cases where nothing works. So this will be actually my uh, example applications for all of this. And it's going to be the modeling of natural convection in nuclear metal reactors. So, Natu natural convection, by essence, that is a global phenomenon. It involves the complete primary circuit and maybe some other parts of the reactor. So the natural choice is the system scale. But the problem is that with our reactor designs, with big pools of liquid metal uh, all over the primary circuit, this is something that is hard to describe if you only have volume 0D or 1D components that you network together. 
one one phenomenon of interest, for instance, is the behavior of the outlet jet in the hot pool, and if you will have stratification, or maybe uh, the the possibility of interwater flow cooling between the hot pool and the core. You also have these uh, radial heterogeneities between subassemblies that could have an effect. And you could try to introduce physical models in the system code, but they are going to be very bo both dependent on geometry and transients. And so it's uh, complicated. It's very hard to introduce physical models as well. So the first thing you can do, and this was done in the past, is that if you for, the first thing is if you, you if you are studying a transient where you may have local effects that are hard to simulate, but they have no consequences on the overall behavior of the transient, then you can just do your system scale simulation, core scale, and then do some kind of post-processing with a finer code. If there is an effect, but uh, you don't want to model it or describe it in detail, you can take conservative hypothesis. For instance, you can say, I don't really know what the inlet temperature in this pipe will be, but I will take the worst possible value, for instance, the one coming out of the core here, and I take that coming into the core, and I will get a conservative model. But maybe with more recent design, you will need, it, it would be interesting to reduce this conservative hypothesis to have some more margins and optimize the reactor design. So maybe we, so it's a big motivation. There's a big motivation to move beyond these two simple approaches. So when you, when you look at the actual situation, so I can, so this diagram comes up again. When you look at these three competing paths for moving heat from the core to this uh, decay heat removal heat exchanger. You have path one, normal flow, path two, recirculation loops between subassemblies, and path number three, recirculation loops in the interwaffle gaps. If you have the standard system scale approach, the only thing you can model more or less correctly is this path number one. Because for instance, trying to model path number two, you need to know what the temperatures are inside the hot pool. If you have one big average value between this part and this part, then computing the flow here will be, co will be uh, completely inaccurate. This path going between the subassemblies, it requires knowing the 3D temperature inside the subassemblies and the heat conduction to the interrupter gap. Same, uh, and same thing, it's very hard to model in STH. So usually, with the system scale approach, you, you compute this, but it's not accurate. And this one, number three, the interrupter flow is neglected. So what, what's going to actually happen is that because you have removed some mechanism for decay heat removal, the core temperature will tend to be higher in the simulation than in the, in the real case, which is actually OK. It's conservative. But you will also overestimate the amount of work done by this path number one. This means that you will overestimate the primary flow rate, and this will lead you to increasing problems for the average temperature on this side, average temperature for this side on one, and can potentially be bad. And so you need an approach where you can somewhat, somehow model these other two paths. So the first thing you can do is that you can say, OK, let's look at uh, all the tools on my at my disposal and i will choose the one that can model all these phenomena and the one that you can use is cfd this is what is required in the hot pool in the cold pool and in the core and uh, what people have done is that they have done models of complete reactor primary circuits using the cfd code and here you can see an example model of this for the for a lead fast reactor and here you can see the same for a sodium fast reactor and so this uh, means that you can use the code you already have, but at the same time, it also means that you will need to re-implement the models that you already had in the system scale in order to model a reactor front. So for instance, the, the useful models are the point kinetics in the core, the pumps in the primary circuit, and so on. And you will need to re-implement that in the transient simulation. Another potential cost is that if you do everything in CFD, you will have fine modeling in the regions that are of interest to you. So for instance, the outlet of the core, the cold pool. 
but you will also have a 3D modeling of this diagrid here, for instance. And this is a region where there are no 3D effects, but you will still have a CFD mesh, and so you will pay for computational costs, where, even where you do not need it. Another thing that you can do, and this is what we actually did in CEA, is that you can take the codes you already have, so systems of channel CFD, and try to use them together. So for instance, you would have the system scale, and then inside the sub-assemblies, you, you would use the sub-channel scale. Inside the hot and cold pool, you would use CFD because you want to know some the 3D, the 3D behavior. And this means you can have maximum reuse of what you of your or the work you have already. But on the other hand, you will need to make all these codes work together, and you will need an algorithm to ensure that when all these codes work together, they're actually giving you three aspects of a consistent global simulation. And uh, this is something you can do uh, in a number of ways. And here, I've given you as an example the way we use at CEA. What we do is that initially, we've got the system code here. So the courses code is actually present in the complete simulation. And then we decide that part of the, part of the, of the simulation, which for instance could be the hot pool, is going to be overlaid with a finer CFD simulation like right here. So what we can, in, if you want to ensure that you have a consistent simulation where the system code is computing this part and the CFD is computing this part, what you can do is that, for instance, you take the temperature here from the system code, you impose it as a boundary condition to the CFD. And on the other end, for instance here, you take the average outlet temperature on the CFD and you impose it right on the inside of the system code. And with this, you can have a global energy conservation between the core system scale and the fine CFD scale. It's a bit more complicated when you consider the velocities and the pressures. So usually what you do is that you got the system model, you measure the flow rate at this point, and you impose it as a boundary condition to the finer scale, the CFD. Because liquid metals are almost incompressible, then you will have the same flow coming out, and you will not need to, to do anything. It's also going to come out on that end in the system side. What's interesting? The, the thing, the interesting thing is that in a simulation like this, if you want to have a global a consistent picture between this side and this side, you need to ensure that the pressure difference between those two points in the system side is the same as the one predicted by the CFD code. So actually, you need to do something extra. You need to change what the system code calculates for this in order to match the delta p on the CFD side. And this can be done by introducing an a little, what we call a momentum source term, an artificial force here. And this source, we adjust it in order to change the pressure difference on the system side until we've got the same delta p on the system side as on the CFD side. And this is enough to ensure a consistent global sim simulation. On the other hand, it needs to be done in, as an iterative process. You need to try different values and pick the right one. So once you do this, you can do some uh, complicated 3D simulation complicated coupled simulation of a sodium fast reactor going into natural convection. So here you have a, an example from the Astrid project at CEA. So this is the reactor in normal state. You've got the core at the subchannel state, at the subchannel scale. Starting from this part, this is, free, this is CFD. So here you can see the outer jet of the core, for instance, goes into the primary side of the, of the heat exchangers and into the cold pool with this outlet jet here. And finally, into the pumps on this side and below the core. So starting from the pumps, we are at the system scale with uh, our system code Qatar, and we stay at the system scale until we go back into the core. And the, in natural convection, the picture is completely different. At the outlet of the core, instead of having a strong outlet jet like this, you have a small chimney flow like this. You've got a chimney effect going all the way up from the core. The, the hot pool itself is stratified. There is some hot sodium at the top, an interface in the middle, and some cooler sodium at the bottom. 
And this is because you have this decay heat exchanger cooling down flow sodium in the hot pool and injecting cooler flow here. On the other side, on the cold pool, you also have stratification. The jet of the, from the heat exchanger is no longer present. Instead, you have uh, this kind of completely stratified flow. The cold pool is uh, not uniform anymore. You've got hotter sodium at the top and cooler sodium at the bottom with a very strong interface. And uh, in general, the situation is completely different. So when you look at uh, the actual results from this, so this is the the predicted flow rate in a number of simulations corresponding to this case. If you do an initial system scale computation, you will have a, a flow prediction like this. It goes down to around 1% of the initial flow rate, the nominal one. And then at some point, it rises up and goes around to around 2% of the nominal flow rate. And then starting from this system scale approach, we did our first CFD coupled simulation with CFD, and we obtained the blue curve. So that's uh, that was a bit worrisome because the the, C, the the first coupled simulation predicts a lower flow rate, and the, it's almost uh, minus 30, 40 percent at the end of the transient. And so the, this was a so the, this meant that if you only had the system scale, you would have problems predicting the actual flow rate in a conservative way. One thing you can do is that if you the, the main source of this overestimation is that in the system scale, you have usually a thermal exchange computed between the hot pool and the cold pool. And this heat exchange is computed with the average temperatures. So you will have a heat exchange coefficient times the difference between this average and this average. In nominal state, this is a very good approximation because this and this are homogeneous. In natural convection, if you take the average of this temperature minus, minus the average of this temperature, it will be very far from the actual reality. And if you're at the system scale, one thing you can do is that you can say, OK, I won't be able to compute this correctly, so I'm going to remove this coefficient and produce a conservative estimate. And this is the green curve. So the green curve is system scale only again, but with the conservative hypothesis. And you can, you can say, OK, I, I'm back in business again because now I'm con I've got a conservative prediction of the flow rate compared to the first copper calculation. And then next step is uh, how about when you do a, a simulation where you have system scale and CFD in the pools and the sub-channel scale between the sub-assemblies. In this case, so this is what you need to do to predict interwrapper flow, and you end up with the purple curve. And the purple curve is even lower than the most conservative system scale calculation we can make. So this means that in this case, it's very hard to get a conservative prediction of the flow rate without an advanced approach that can model local effects. If you compare the initial prediction here to the final one with the coupled simulation here, the difference is more than 100%. So actually, for the design we had at the time at CEA, we really needed to have these uh, advanced simulation tools with subchannel and CFD in order to get the correct prediction of our flow rate. So then, of course, you've got the next issue is that once you, you've done your simulation, you, need, uh, you, have you will have introduced a lot of physical models. So for instance, in CFD, you could have turbulence models. In the system scale, you could have friction and heat transfer models and so on. And all these models must be established from experiments. If you have a DNS CFD, you do not need anything. And if you have a system state simulation, you need, you need a model for every physical phenomenon. And this is what we call validation. But because thermal hydraulics is nonlinear, one, one potential thing is that if you have, for instance, a phenomenon like this one, and you can, it's a local phenomenon like heat transfer in a subassembly, and you validate it using a local experiment on this whole range of parameters, the same as in the reactor. When you combine it with another phenomenon, you could have interactions between them and new effects. A big, uh, and in this case, what you need to do is that you need to not only have experiments over the whole range of parameters from one phenomenon, 
but you also need experiments that combine these parameters to have some idea of this behavior. But because, of course, you cannot do uh, something as big as the reactor before you do the reactor, you will have a size limit on this experiment. You will not be able to go all the way to reactor scale. And you also need uh, what we call system or industrial test integral validation. Tests that are done on existing reactors that you predict with your uh, model, your the, the modeling tool of choice, and you check that uh, you are consistent with what was actually measured. And then you will actually try to predict your own reactor case right here. So this is what we call the hierarchy of experiments. You've got separ separate effect experiments, one phenomenon, but in detail, combined effect experiments, several ex separate phenomena, sep phenomena all together inside the large experiment, and then integral validation reactor cases. So if we look at uh, some example of experiments you need when you want to model this uh, natural convection issue. The first thing is that you need to model is uh, natural convection and its interaction with 3D effects in different parts of the reactor. And for this, there, there is a range of uh, lead and sodium experiments, especially a lot of them have been performed in European projects with names like uh, FINS or SESAMI. And so, for instance, in the, at KTH in Sweden, they have an experiment where you have a loop in lead based mutatectic, and in the middle, there is what they call a 3D section, a little cylinder of hot lead. And this cylinder will stratify like this, and there, there, may, there may be a jet at the bottom that can either go all the way to the top or get stuck on this stratification. And this is something you can use to model, to check if you are modeling correctly the interaction between 3D effects and the uh, overall natural situation, circulation. At uh, ENEA in Italy, there is an integral experiment called Circe on the same, uh, on the same uh, issue. And there is a scaled down experiment of the Mira reactor project called Escape being known at uh, SCK CEN in Belgium. There is also the issue of, uh, of the hydro thermal hydraulic coupling between the inside of each of assembly and the interrupt of flow. And for this one, you can do some small scale analytical experiments like this one in KIT in Germany, where they had three sub assemblies with seven pins each, a model, the, the thermal hydraulic transfer with the interrupt of flow in the middle and a lot of thermocouples to check that the codes can predict it correctly. And then at a larger scale, you have Japanese experiments, Plantel at JIA, which can model both the core itself with uh, uh, as much as 55 sub-assemblies and its coupling to the overall hot pool. And these experiments are actually of very high importance to, to show how much interrupter flow can, how much heat interrupter flow can remove from the, from the core to the hot pool and then to the decay heat exchangers. And finally, there is, a, there is a possibility that in the near future, we could have large experiments where you have both the core with interrupter flow and uh, the rest of the pool. And this, this is something that, for instance, uh, could, be, could be experimented on, on the clear rest facility for a lead pass three, a lead bismuth pass reactor in China. And then going uh, at the larger scale, we have uh, integral tests. And so for this one, here I've put, I've put a list of interesting liquid metal tests for validating liquid metal from analytics codes. Most of these tests, are, all of these tests are on sodium past reactors because uh, we've got uh, the, the, the integral, the reactor scale experience of this one. And for instance, we've got tests that were performed at the end of life of the, of the Phoenix reactor right here. So for instance, at the end of life of, of, at the end of, life of Phoenix in 2009-2010, we did the natural convection tests. So first, we stopped the heat sink. Actually, we started with what we call a loss of heat sink. And then we shut down the pumps and we did a protected loss of flow, PLOF, natural convection test. And this is something on which we did both, we did public benchmarks in the IIEF, in an IIEF CRP and in a European project framework. And here you, you can already see the importance of international organization in sharing this reactor scale data. More recently, we also shared data on a dissymmetric test, a test where we shut off one of these two intermediate loops and not the other, and then 
And this allowed us to measure 3D effect in the cold pool. And we shared data on this test for a new EU benchmark in the, 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 what, in the Sesame project. And it is currently being shared in the GIF SFR safety and operation working group. So I think this is a really big incentive to join this SFR SNO working group. And then we've got tests on EBR2, uh, so from, uh, from the OE. So in the past, there was an IAES ERP on two loss of flow tests, so natural convection, 17, which was a protected loss of flow, and 45 error, which was, which was unprotected. So today, two public tests for my, through IAEA. And then more recently, DOE has proposed two loss of heatsink tests. So the pumps keep operating, but the heatsink is, is lost in the same GIF SFR safety and operation framework. So these ones are called Bob 301 and 302 R. And finally, so since the since the let's see September 20, 2018, we have had the uh, benchmark on the FFTF, loop type sodium pass reactor at the OE as well. And this was a non-protected loss of flow test cause, co called the uh, was. And this one is actually in progress, and uh, this is an IAES ERP. And the first, um, the first meeting with the presentation of the blind results and so on will be uh, next April, actually. And this is an ongoing benchmark. So as you can see, if you want to, to obtain integral validation, check and share reactor data, IAEA and the GIF play a very important role. And so, uh, moving, and so, Moving on from this application to natural convection, I, I got a little conclusion right here. So the first one is that in liquid metal reactors, uh, as I showed you, there are a lot of interesting thermohydraulic phenomena. And we need to describe them. So some are related to normal operations, some are operated are related to accidental scenarios, but uh, we, we usually end up needing to model them. And in order to do that, we have developed a range of codes with different modeling scales. So we've got CFD, computational fluid dynamics, both DNS direct numerical simulation, where you simulate everything and you need no physical models. Although then to LES, some fluctuations, and then runs, all turbulent fluctuations are modeled with a, with a physical model. Then the subchannel scale, a bit coarser, and finally the system scale, where you need physical models for everything. And then in many cases, Given a problem of choice, one of the one of the scales here will be what you need. So, for instance, for local phenomena, if you have if you need to account for fluctuations, you need to use LES. If you don't care about fluctuations, runs will be all you need. If you need a subassembly for hydraulics at the level of a second subassembly and locally, you can use CFD. If you need to do it over the whole core, then the subchannel scale will be uh, the one of interest. And if you want to model reactor transient, you will need the system scale, the coarsest one. And in some cases, this may not be enough. And you may need, and you may need to do something more complicated, for instance, uh, coupling between different codes. And in all cases, a lot of the work, and actually the majority of the work, will be actually in the in the an aspect that we don't think about at the beginning. It's in it's the experimental validation of all these physical models. And for this, we need experimental data at small scales, all the way to a real actual reactor. And this is where international collaboration is extremely important. And that's all from me. Thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Antoine, very much for your presentation. Um, there have been several questions posed. Uh, we'll give people just another second to type in questions that they may have um, at your, following your conclusion. And in that time, we'll just take a peek at the upcoming webinar presentations. Um, in February, there is a presentation on SFR safety design criteria and safety design guidelines. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the shift in time scheduling for that presentation. Uh, rather than in the morning U.S. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to shift that to 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time to more um, 
align better with the Japanese presenter. In March, we have a presentation on micro reactors, a technology option for accelerated innovation. And in April, the GIF VHTR Hydrogen Production Project Management Board. I am um, So the first question on the list is, shouldn't the LMR reactor group include solid fueled but clean molten salt cooled reactors as well? It's just another high temperature so, uh, low pressure coolant. Mm -hmm. So of course, molten salt is a very interesting option. And act actually, uh, even, in C even in CA in France, uh, so as you may know, our, our big sodium fast reactor project, Astrid, uh, came to a stop at the end of last year. And uh, see, since the beginning of this year, we have started to look into molten salt as well, mainly as a, as a, as a liquid fuel, so with the, with the fuel inside the coolant. And there is also the option of uh, having solid fuel, but molten salt as a liquid. And in this case, the, the main issue will be both the, the a material problem like uh, corrosion, corrosion under radiation, and things like that. And the the main advantage of liquid metal in this case, for sodium, for instance, there is almost no corrosion issue if you control for oxygen content. So you can use standard stainless steel and be convinced that uh, these materials will last the lifetime of your reactor. And of course, if you if we if we do the material R and D, we may find a material that does the same thing for a molten salt, but uh, if you if you ask me to design a high temperature molten salt reactor right now, mm -hmm. I would have uh, big issues with the materials of choice. But uh, this may change in the near to medium future, and this is something that I agree should be looked into. For lead, it's uh, it's more or less the same. You you there there is uh, there are a few more issues with corrosion of corrosion of thin in lead. You need some oxygen content in order to to have a, an oxide layer on the steel to prevent lead from uh, somewhat uh, corroding it. But still, it's a way easier materials problem than molten salt would be. So I think as a, as an option, we need we need to keep investigating the two liquid metal reactor concepts because these ones, more or less, we we know how to make them without considering. Even, uh, for instance, we, we know the choice of materials, we know all the issues and so on. But if, if we're considering a, a project for a, a bit of a longer term, then uh, everything is interesting, of course. Great, thank you. The next question. Please describe the function of the core catcher and the flow patterns when the core catcher is catching the melted core. Hmm. So, so this is something that we included in the, the Astrid project, and we, we also see in a few sodium fast reactor designs. So of course, if, if you have a severe accident in a, in, in a sodium fast reactor in this case, you, so at, the fuel is, is going to melt in the core, and at some point, it, it may come down, right? So, in, so both, uh, for instance, going into the control rod sub-assemblies and, and all the way down. And of course, you've got the, You've got the main vessel at the bottom, and so you you can choose two things: either to keep the corium inside the, the primary vessel at all costs, or you let the you let the corium go down to the main vessel, cause a leak, and uh, catch the corium below. So in Astrid, our choice was to say that we will coach we will catch all the corium inside the main vessel all the time, and the advantage with that is that there will not be a leak, and once the the corium is on the score catcher, so the thing that will catch the, the corium going down and stop it finally, then it, we will be in a position where we can cool it more easily because we will be in, we will be in sodium. We can use one of, the, the decay, one of these decay heat exchangers to remove heat from the top of the pool, and there will be natural convection flow from the core catcher at the bottom to the heat exchanger at the top. And of course, the big question we had was uh, what material what material can we include for this core catcher? 
and we were considering we were considering things like uh, zirconia or other materials like that and the big issue is that can you find the material that will both be able to catch and dissipate the corium and will also last for the 60 years of uh, lifetime of the reactor so will it work if there is a core disruption accident and if we don't need to use it, can we at least check that it will be there for it will not cause problem during the 60 year lifetime of the reactor? So the function of the core catcher is that if corium manages to come down from the core, we need to have a material that cannot that will not be ablated by the corium. So usually a ceramics or zirconia. Thank you. There's a question about the IHX design specifically. Why the aspect ratio of IHX is so high? If more heat transfer tubes are used, the height of the IHX can be reduced. Is there any restriction about the IHX design regarding to its height or aspect ratio? So, the, so this is actually so something that we did in the in the Astrid project to reduce the overall diameter on, of the primary pool. So in the in the French SFR design, and I think this is also valid for the Russian SFR designs. We have the core in the middle, and then we have the heat exchangers and the pumps on the outside. And so, if we want to have the smallest vessel we can, we need to we need to make our heat ex our heat exchangers uh, as small as possible in the horizontal di direction. And because we are trying to make them thinner, if we want the same heat transfer, we we tended to make them longer. And so they end up going all the way down, as you can see in the picture. And this is actually something that. Um, this is related to our complicated flow behavior in natural convection. It, it's because our heat exchangers are so long that uh, we have low natural convection flow rate, uh, as you can see on one of the slides. It's slower than, uh, than it would be if the heat exchanger was short and at the top of the reactor. Nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a thing you can do if you want to optimize your reactor design as much as possible. And you can, even with uh, long heat exchangers like this, you can still have good overall core cooling if you if you model all the possible decay heat removal paths between the core and the final heating. Thank you. Um, Gareth also had a question about extending the code use to uh, molten salt reactors, and I'm not sure, but I believe you've answered that question. Do you have any more thoughts on that? So normally, if you go from uh, liquid metal to molten salts, from the thermal hydraulics point of view, the big difference will be the heat transfer modeling in, uh, for instance, CFD codes or system codes. So in, in liquid metals, we have usually they have a very high thermal conductivity. And so you, you are in a case where the turbulence has an effect on momentum, but does not affect the heat transfer itself very much because the heat transfer is being done by the very high thermal conductivity. And in molten salt, on the other end, you have a very low thermal conductivity, actually, lower than water, for instance. And so you need, we need different turbulence models, for instance, to correctly predict uh, the behavior in a molten salt reactor. Another thing that needs to be done is that if you have, uh, if you have liquid fuel, and uh, the, you know you will have this, uh, the, 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 the delay in neutron precursors, so the the, sorry, the delayed neutron emitters, so the, the radioactive elements that, in, that emit the delayed neutron fra fraction, will be moved around by the fluid. And so we, in this case, we really need both to predict where they are going with the, C, with the thermal hydraulics, so with the CFD code, and we need to couple it with 3D neutronics to get the actual power distribution in the core even. So currently, for molten salt reactors, we are working on a coupling between or CFD code and uh, a 3D deterministic uh, neutronics code in order to, to be able to correctly model a molten salt reactor, for instance. Thank you. Do you, um, Liz, Liz, um, with the university mathematics departments, for example, the application of group theory and geometrical methods to the solution of differential and difference equations, the emphasis of combination of analytical and numerical methods, and also the use of symbolic computation. So on, on this part, 
there are, there are, there are a range actually of computational methods that have been tried in each of the scales of modeling we have. So for instance, one of the system codes, so the one with uh, 0D and 1D models, the German version of this, they use a direct method of, a direct method of characteristics to solve that, their differential equation. Usually, the, the main thing that we see used in these codes are finite volumes, because uh, physicists have made them, and so they are interested in conservation relations. And uh, myself, I've worked on the, on, the of, uh, on the numerical scheme of this sort. And uh, for people that uh, really have, that want to have a very good conversion rate on their differential equations, mainly uh, for the DNS, direct numerical simulation, the, the DOE uses a code with uh, spectral elements. So a, a finite element method where you increase the degree inside each element as you refine. And so you get exponential convergence to the analytical solution. But uh, I should say that yeah, the, the main thing you see is uh, finite volume methods with uh, first order, discre first order uh, discretization, both in time and in space. And uh, this is because usually you see physicists behind these calculations. And so they're interested in some very down to earth conservation properties, even on the discrete solution. There's a couple of um, similar themed questions. I'm going to go ahead and skip through the line a little bit. Um, the non-dimensionalist, uh, I apologize, parental sodium number for sodium at a typical operating temperature is very low. What is the significance of this? And then there's one more on um, how do you explore the parameter space? Do you conduct probabilis probabilistic, such as Monte Carlo analysis? So first, for the, for the parental number, the practical consequence in sodium is that if we, for instance, look at uh, how, you, could mo how uh, you can perform a CFD simulation of a sodium reactor, then we, we will use a, a turbulence model for the momentum, for the velocity. But on the thermal side, be because of the 5, 10 to the minus 4 parental number, on the thermal side, we can just use the naive laminar conduction rate. And this actually accounts for all the conduction you need. Same thing at the system scale. In the, so the, the non-dimensional number for, for heat transfer is what we call the Nusselt number. And it's, it's around the four in the laminar flow, and then it goes up with turbulence. And in sodium, you can take constant Nusselt number equal to five, and it will predict the whole uh, the whole interesting range of, of parameters. So, in, in, so the, this very low frontal actually in sodium it's so low that it simplifies things a lot. You can you can model heat transfer as if you were in laminar flow almost. In lead, it's a bit less uh, guaranteed because the frontal is a bit higher, but uh, still you have this type of phenomena. For the second question, so for the the non-dimensional parameter range. So in, in ex when we do validation and experiments, we try to cover as much of the actual parameter range as, pos as possible when we are doing our experimental tests. And then there is an interesting point when we perform reactor simulations. So in, this, in these simulations, one uh, thing that is very common today is that we may want to do uncertainty propagation or what uncertainty analysis of our reactor scale calculations. And so we will have a range of uh, input parameters, for instance, what was the power of the reactor at the beginning. We may have some, some uh, uncertainties on the physical models as well. So for instance, we know the friction coefficient somewhere, but not with 100% uh, accuracy. We have, some, uh, we have some uncertainty on that. And then uh, we will propagate these uncertainties and assess their effect on the final output result. And this is something we do. Uh, well, sometimes, usually in a naive way with, what we, with the Wilkes method where you do 207 calculations and you do some statistics. But what's also really common is to use Monte Carlo sampling of these parameters, build a meta model of the simulation on top, and then do our uncertainty analysis on the meta model. So actually, we, we, it's, uh, it's rather common to use uh, Monte Carlo propagation at some point. Thank you. 
How would you couple STH with CFD when there is local or temporary boiling and voiding in the core? In this case, the core exit flow rate can be different from the inlet flow rate and can be even be reverse flow as the voids collapse. So yeah, so the, the, so the method I showed in my, in my earlier slide actually only works with a single phase flow. And we, we actually tried it in a situation where you have boiling on one of the side and not on the other, and it, of course it doesn't work at all. So what we are working on right now is um, we want to move from this uh, overlapping coupling you saw here to, uh, to what we call a decomposition coupling, where you, have, you take out the gray part on the system side, you have the CFD, and then we want to use what what we want to use. We want to use uh, uh, what we call a monolithic or complete Newton coupling. So what we want to do is that on the CFD side, we compute both what the flow would be at the next time step, and we compute the derivative of this flow relate versus the input and output pressure. And then we put both as an into the system code, we input both the, the, the result itself and its derivatives. And so then we can do the solution on the system side and come back. So the answer is that the, this type of, uh, the type of coupling I, sh I showed does not work in uh, two-phase flows. And uh, the thing we are working on is a coupling where you, you do not have an overlapping between codes like this. And at the same time, you need a more monolithic, a tighter procedure to couple between the codes. You need to exchange more data. Thank you. There's another question similar. Please remove the simulation issues when there's two phase flow due to metal boiling, but I believe um, you've just addressed that. Do you have any additional thoughts? Excuse me, thoughts. Yeah, so, so, so this was, uh, so these were the issues related to cut coupling for two phase flow. But of course, uh, two phase flow have also need to be modeled on the thermal hydraulic side, and this is very complicated. So the first, the first thing is that the, usually the, the, models we, the models we have initially come from our physical understanding of water flows. And so we need to change them completely in order to do, uh, to do uh, boiling sodium. So for instance, um, in sodium, there is almost no critical heat flux. It's very rare to encounter critical heat flux. And at the same time, because the liquid to vapor density ratio is very high, around 2000, it means that almost as soon as there is boiling somewhere, immediately you will have some very large pockets of gas taking all the space in the subassembly. And so all the physical models for this, so two-phase friction, two-phase heat transfer, the flow map and so on, needs to be redone. And actually, for in this part, um, we are, we are collaborating as much as we can with IPPA in Russia on uh, our understanding of two-phase flow. And this is because they have an ongoing experiment on two-phase flow in IPP. And another, another point, important point is that if you have boiling sodium in the core, then there will be a very large effect on the neutronics. So normally, if, if, you, if you add uh, an old uh, type sodium pass reactor like uh, Super Phoenix or Super Phoenix in France, the, these reactors have a positive void reactivity effect. So as soon as the coolant starts to boil, the reactivity increases, the boiling accelerates, and you have uh, power extrusion in, uh, in less than one second. On the other end, in, uh, in some uh, more recent reactor design, like uh, BN800 or Astrid was also of this type, B, uh, BN1200, sorry, or Astrid, you, we, used, uh, we used devices like um, liquid, uh, sodium plenum above the core. And in this case, when the sodium boils, this plenum will be replaced with, with vapor and this will increase neutron leakage. And with this, you can have, instead of a, a positive global void effect, you can get to a negative global void effect. And this means that as soon as the boiling starts, the power will go down. And so, and, but it will not go down the same way everywhere. It will go down faster in the areas where the sodium is boiling. So it will be localized in a few subassemblies, for instance. And so we need to account for very complicated coupling effect, coupled effects between neutronics and thermal hydraulics, usually including 3D effects. And the final one is that the, the, the fuel mechanics will also be impacted. 
because the fuel mechanics determine it determines the fuel temperature and then the Doppler effect. You need to know what is going to happen to the fuel to the to the fuel thermomechanical properties during the transient, and this is also a very big issue for uh, correctly modeling a transient where the sodium boils. Thank you. As for the load following mode, what are the conclusions of your studies for SFRs? Are material issues different than those with LWRs? Well, our, our main experience with with SFRs is that usually it's uh, it's simpler than a, than an LWR. The big difference are uh, because of so, for instance, in all force. In, so, for, for instance, uh, when you look at the physical models, the complexity in them and so on, they are actually simpler for SFRs or LFRs. The only complexity comes when, uh, because of the pool type design, you have uh, complicated 3D, pheno 3D phenomena and then you, did, you need to do something more. But for instance, uh, when we were considering the, all the safety-related transients for the Astrid project, you have all these transients where you still have the pumps operating, either in, at nominal or at, uh, at on diesel power. And for all these situations, we could, we could use our system code and get, uh, get good results and uh, have validated physical models and so on. A, bi a, big, is a big issue was that the, the models are simpler, but you still need validation experiments, right? So you, you need to, to we, need, we needed to do a lot of literature reviews to, to, to get the best model we could, and also sometimes uh, end up with the, the, idea, the idea that we needed to commission a new experiment for one part or another. But overall, coming from LWR to, to SFRs on the system side, the big issue is this uh, pool time design. And th this is actually something you see as well in uh, water type small and modular reactors. Like uh, if you, today we have designs for uh, water cooled pool type SMRs. So the, the same, same idea as an SFR actually, so except you have water in the middle. And uh, at the same end, if you, if you use a pool type design in water as well, you encounter the same problem with uh, complicated 3D flows. So it's been an interesting journey. Thank you. What is the current status of validation of physical models? So at the, Let's see. At, at the in our current status, I would say that we have we have we have had uh, satisfactory like uh, what we call separate effect validation. So validation of uh, each physical model individually. It was we we managed to get good coverage in the system code and so on. The big exception from that was if you if you are the system scale, if you introduce a new component design, then we would have needed. A related experiment, a scaled down experiment of this particular geometry. So there was the idea that we had good general validation, but maybe we would need some design specific validation if there was some geometry change. For the validation of CFD and coupling, I think at the using all these different experiments and reactor validation and so on, we had reached a good level of validation for uh, a reactor a reactor scale application of this coupled simulation. And act actually, this type of coupled situations were our reference, uh, our reference choice for the safety report of Astrid, for instance. We would have needed more, especially we would have needed more in case of uh, reactor changes or things like that maybe, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think it would have been much. And then of course, the, as we receive more reactor validation, it's always good to add it uh, as well. And uh, the big the big point where we we need to do predictions and we do not have enough validation as at all is this uh, two phase flow. So on two phase flow, we we need more experimental data for the physical models. Although so we we have done a lot, we we have done as much as we could. We need more. We need experimental validation for the coupled the coupled effect between thermal hydraulics and neutronics and fluid mechanics. And uh, we need to up, uh, uh, and we need to uh, have the, we need we need this to be able to justify that in a future in a in a future sodium fast reactor if the coolant boils it would not lead to a severe accident. And actually for this the the FFTF benchmark is very useful because in FFTF you add an oxide core 
like uh, as three, for instance, and oxide core have a, have a very unfavorable Doppler effect in case of a loss of flow. And in FFTF, they did an unprotected transient anyway, and the power did not rise. And the, the, the way they did it is that they added some uh, extra devices on the outside of the reactor. And so uh, the, these devices could mitigate what would have been otherwise a power excursion, and instead the, the, the reactor the, the reactor power went down all the way. And so with this type of, uh, of, re of reactor scale multi-physics validation, we may, uh, we, may, we may reach a situation where we can have validated two-phase flow uh, simulations. But this, this is the big, uh, the, big, uh, yeah, the big work area for the next few years. Thank you. And when I forwarded you some um, discussion that's been posted, I don't see a question in there. Um, is that something we can just read and share with folks? Let's see. I see a question on the. Yeah, I see a remark from someone on the question on the question side, and it's true that uh, if you're if you're looking at at molten salt as a, as just a coolant and not a fuel, the corrosion problem will be much easier. Okay, I've, I've posted it. I, yeah, I was, um, and it looks like the last question I see is, I've heard of sodium heat pipes and. NASA reactor, is there any opportunity to remove decay heat using heat pipes? Well, in, in our case, I would say that actually, if you, so for, for this um, decay heat removal circuit, actually, just using the liquid sodium, you're, you're, you already get a very high performance heat exchanger. So for, if you add, uh, I, I guess, if you add uh, like a uh, a sodium cooled SMR, so something smaller, then there would be an event, there may be an advantage in using a single pipe between the the core between the the primary pool and the heat sink. So this is something you could do with a heat pipe instead of a full circuit with two with two legs. On the other hand, for instance, even if you have a, a very large sodium fast reactor, like if you have like the ESFR smart project in Europe. So that's a project for a 1.5 gigawatt sodium fast reactor. And you only need, I think, um, yeah, you, you, you can remove something like uh, six or seven megawatts per heat exchanger in a chimney. And in this case, it's, it's easier to just do two legs and keep liquid sodium. I think that uh, may be complicated with a heat pipe is that if you want liquid sodium on the primary side, and you put a heat pipe in, you will need to, to put the sodium at less than ambient pressure. And um, you, may, you may have issues of, about uh, chemical, well, uh, ingress, ingress of air inside the pipes or things like that. So I think it, it would be, it's easier to just have a, a liquid circuit and its own a little purification and sodium. But it's, uh, for a smaller reactor, it could be interesting. You've received lots of accolades and thank yous. It was a wonderful presentation today. Thank you again for your um, sharing your expertise with us. Uh, it's always it's always good to see so many engaged participants with the number of questions. Very interesting topic. Thank you. Yes, thank you again, uh, Antoine. It was really good. And uh, what is really interesting is this Q and A section. A, a strong momentum, good dynamic. Thank you, Antoine. Thank you. And so, uh, with that, okay, we'll so conclude today's presentation. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye.